we go behind the scenes of a garden that is nothing short of presidential, as well as discussing its truly unique design and plant palette. You won't want to miss it, so stay tuned as we garden smart from Texas. The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program makes house calls. By ordering online, the lawn you want can be delivered right to your door. The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program is a proud sponsor of Public Television and Garden Smart. I should be arrested for crimes against potted plant kind. My house is where plants came to die. miracle Grow Potting Mix is designed to help grow big, beautiful plants. Everyone grows with miracle Grow. I'm joined by Mark Langdale, who is the president of the George W. Bush Foundation. We're here on the site of the very newly constructed uh, presidential center. Mark, what can you tell us about the center? Well, it's a building that uh, we've just completed. It's on the campus of Southern Methodist University on a 24-acre site, that, and it consists of two buildings. One of them is the 13th Presidential Library and Museum that will be dedicated on April 25th by all the living presidents, and we, the foundation, will gift that to the American people as the repository and future home of the Bush presidential records. Uh, the other building is the home of the George W. Bush Institute where President Bush and Laura Bush will continue to uh, be involved in policy issues that they're interested in through the private sector and through philanthropy. The interesting thing about the building is, is that uh, we, Robert Stern, the Dean of Architecture at Yale University designed the building, but we also hired Michael Van Valkenburg, the landscape architect, at the very beginning to partner with Bob Stern to design the, 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 the center complex so that it was enveloped within a 24-acre site that we've turned into a native plant demonstration project. It's a 15-acre park. It'll be the largest park in the University Park City uh, that'll be available to SMU students and University Park residents during the day to, to come and explore and learn about how you use native plant palettes to create a sustainable and long-term viable garden. So you basically have gone with a, a prairie type theme with the garden, is that correct? That, yes, yes, it's a Texas native prairie restoration. This is something that Laura Bush um, has always been interested in. They have a ranch near Crawford, Texas that uh, called Prairie Chapel Ranch. They've had it since 1999 and she's always been involved in native grass and, and wildflower restoration there. And so her passion for that topic has been translated to what we've done here on the site of the Presidential Center. It sounds like a fascinating project. I can't wait to tour, Mark. I hope you, I hope you enjoy it. I hope so too, thank you very much. I'm joined here today by Herb Sweeney on this blustery, cold, and rainy spring day in Texas. Herb, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. I understand you have a landscape architecture degree from Penn State. As far as your, your uh, design aesthetic goes, what kind of designs inspire you? How do you like to design gardens? Um, I've, uh, I've always had an interest in environmentally sensitive approaches to landscape. And uh, what I've had the opportunity to at Michael Van Valkenburg Associates is to focus on um, integrating some of those uh, sustainable systems into projects. So 
um, anywhere from how to uh, manage uh, water to um, appropriateness of plant material uh, selection on projects. This site here is a very fascinating project. You've been involved in it for many years already. And you, your team was basically taking a vision that, that Lar Bush had yes. and integrating it with a, a, a fairly challenging urban site. How did you go about tackling that? At the very outset of the project, uh, we were involved with Mrs. Bush and the architects to initiate the site planning. And at that moment, Mrs. Bush identified that the presidential center was to be a good neighbor and not only a uh, setting for the building, but also an open space or park for the neighborhood, for SMU students, and for visitors alike. And part of that vision was, was sustainability. Let's talk about the sustainability initiatives. We see it woven throughout the fabric of, of every aspect of this garden. Yes, there, there uh, was great direction from uh, President and Mrs. Bush uh, through their love of the native Texas landscape that we approached this with a, a very, I guess, ambitious, sustainable uh, objectives. And two, two of those components are through native habitat recreation, recreation of uh, native plant communities, prairie plantings, woodlands, and also water conservation, which is one of Texas's most, uh, as well as the United States, most uh, critical issues, environmental issues in addressing today, and how you manage not just water you're using for a project, but also stormwater through the site. Well, Herb, I can't wait to see what you've done here. Let's get started. Great. Large urban sites dealing with the stormwater runoff sometimes can be one of the greatest challenges and it was also one of the elements that, that you really took into account with this design. Can you talk to us about some of those specific systems that were put in place here? So we saw water management as a great opportunity and um, developed a multifaceted approach of how to address stormwater. Starting at the parking lots at the very north of the site capturing all of the surface runoff off of this uh, pavement areas into bioswales, which are then uh, convey the water to the south portion of the site where it is, settles in a wet prairie area, a low-lying area, that then infiltrates into a 250,000 gallon cistern. And also, at the same time as collecting the surface runoff from the site, we're also collecting the building roof water and cooling power blowdown water in these bioswales that are then reused for our irrigation, um, resulting in more than a 50% reduction of potable water that we need for the project. Herb, how does a bioswale work? Um, a bioswale is a low-lying area that uh, collects water, and it's composed of a specialized uh, grouping of uh, plants that are adapted to uh, wet and dry conditions but also adapted to filtering out pollutants and contaminants. And the planting soils are engineered so that they also are able to uh, capture and store water and move water um, down through that profile. I wanna talk a little bit about this structure we have right here, which is, which is part of this, this whole system of purifying the water before it makes it down to your cistern. Um, it's also a, a wonderful piece of hardscape. Um, how, does, how does this work in conjunction with um, you know, the, the rest of the bioswale? Uh, the, the stone seat that's behind us is one of the, the great uh, hydrological innovations that we have on the project. And that rainwater that we're collecting on the western portion, the northern portion of the site that I mentioned, is stored in a gravel reservoir behind this uh, outcropping that's very reminiscent of uh, typical uh, Texas landscape and it slowly released or seeps out from the face so after a rain event it will extend the duration of water um, in the landscape and it also sustains some very moisture loving plants. As a home gardener um, there, there are certain things we can do to conserve water such as using rain barrels um, are there any ways that we can translate these kind of ideas, such as the bioswale and the seep, into the way that we garden at home? I think there are many ideas that are transferable on a smaller scale. Um, and how we've approached bioswales, for example, at the parking areas, 
that uh, slowing the water, mitigating it as it runs off of pavement surfaces through the use of uh, stone, um, and then selection of plants that are appropriate for those wet conditions uh, can be used in a small landscape and creation of rain gardens, um, which are also a very effective way to manage water. Let's talk about the, the plant selection for this landscape. You've done a wonderful job of creating something that looks very natural with these rolling hills and the beautiful wildflowers. What was your design inspiration? One of uh, the things that I feel that people don't understand is that the regional uh, landscape is quite varied and that um, the planting approach was looking at the larger ecotypes or plant groupings such as the blackland prairie, the post oak savanna, or the cross timbers forest, focusing on components that were transferable <laughs> to what is a relatively small urban landscape in relationship to those bigger systems. Right, it's not always practical to create a, a, an enormous prairie. There's, there's a, just a scale there that you know, we can't always translate, but what you have done here is, is put that into a, you know, a more concise context, borrowing where it makes sense, and, and of course utilizing a lot of native plants. Absolutely, and, and pieces similar to not recreating a large uh, expansive prairie um, we've also taken cues such as how water is addressed mm -hmm. on these plant, bigger plant communities uh, with wet prairie plantings being in low-lying areas, um, but also that the plantings are adapted to periods of inundation, such as today maybe, um, <laughs> but also extended periods of drought. And um, we wanted to make sure that the uh, planting approach wasn't just a, a collection of pretty plantings. Um, so we uh, collaborated with the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center um, on restoring ecological function to the site. And Mark Simmons uh, will describe that in further detail for you. Great, well I can't wait to meet uh, Mark and uh, Herb, thank you so much for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. You've done a tremendous job here. Great, thank you for having me. Mark Simmons works with the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in Texas. Mark, what can you tell us about your work with the center? Uh, I'm the uh, director of the Ecosystem Design Group. And we're a group within the Wildflower Center that does um, environmental design, environmental consulting. We work with landscape architects. Um, but we also do scientific research. So it's a place where we have both of those things together. And we base our research program on questions that come up through our consulting. So if there's some area which we find is a little bit new, because a lot of this sort of stuff is very innovative, we can then go and find money to do scientific research. And then we can feed that back into that particular design or even spread it and teach it to, to, to new landscape architects and students. Many of the consulting jobs that you work on deal with prairies and the restoration of prairies. What can you tell us about the prairie ecosystem? How would you describe that? Well, the, you know, the prairie ecosystem is really the quintessential, you know, central North American um, landscape. You know, we've got, it comes all the way down from, from Canada all the way down to here in Texas and partially into Mexico. Um, but also here in Texas, it's a little more unusual because we have convergence of other ecoregions like the eastern deciduous forests and the uh, desert, the Chihuahuan Desert, and uh, the Gulf Prairies. And they're all converging here, which means we've got a huge power to species. This is a very diverse system, one of the most diverse in North America. But the trouble is, a lot of it has gone under the plow. These prairie systems, especially tall grass prairie, has mm. great soil, so it's been good agricultural. And now, you know, with the prairies, we, where we would have had 20 million acres of blackland prairie, which is Texas's tall grass prairie, we've only got less than one tenth of it left. So right. it's largely gone. Um, so it's been quite a challenge to find, you know, to find ways to bring this back. But this is a prime example of bringing back a prairie and inside a city. What does the, the restoration process look like? If you're going into a site that, that say, was prairie or is an ailing prairie or establishing something that looks like a newer prairie mm -hmm. like this, mm -hmm. how does that work? It's, um, it's not difficult, but it does require a slightly different approach to, say, conventional uh, horticulture. And the main reason is, is that the, the species uh, uh, that we're standing in, they've uh, kind of evolved for a long period of time to grow together. Mm -hmm. But when, we, when, when prairie restoration really started going about 15, 20 years ago, people would put a lot of species in and expect them all to do well, and they found they weren't. 
And what we found consequently is what you have to do is you put all your species in, but you change the proportions. So you think of a prairie as a more dynamic landscape and you have to just push it in the right direction. So that's really the trick. You have to think of it more dynamic than say, growing a bed of petunia. Many of the sites that you consult to are larger settings like this one at the Presidential Center. Mm -hmm. And so you have, you have acres, if you will. What's the maintenance like, uh, especially on a larger site like this? Well, the, um, the, the hard part of doing praise is what we just said, is, is getting it set up. So, and the, where you want to watch for um, certain species getting out of hand, or sort of worse still, an invasive species. But once the system's established, they're relatively easy to maintain. Now, it does require that you know your species, know what you're looking at. Um, for, for, for people at first, that's quite confusing, but it's really not that difficult. Um, and we found, you know, you really don't have to put as much input as you would say a conventional lawn. So if you can think about a prairie like this, we may only need to mow it once a year or maybe once wow. every two years. I mean, alter the alternative is, and something that we do, is we even do uh, prescribed fire. <laughs> We've done a lot of that within cities. I mean, that's how this system evolved. Remember, the, these prairie systems evolved under the pressures of drought, fire, and bison. Wow. Now, we can't necessarily introduce bison to a scale like this, <laughs> but we could use fire, and we can right. certainly use mow. And that's really all you need to do. And then, of course, you can, like any garden, you can then manipulate it. If you want particular species to come out, you can come back in and improve proportions of certain more uh, attractive species. Of course. Well, speaking of attractive species, Mark, can you show us some of the plants that you like to use? You bet. Well, here we are in this great stand of blue bonnets. Of course, blue bonnets is Texas state flower and well loved by the state. But you know, what I really like about these, these stands of blue bonnets, because this, this would have happened in the prairie after fire. Blue bonnets are amazing plants. You know, they grow all around the world, in South America, Greenland, Africa. Um, but what's so fascinating about them is their ecology. I mean, these ones here, for instance, they do really well after fire. And this wow. is a species which has evolved with fire. Um, and in fact, this is probably why they think it became the Texas State Flower, because when there were wildfires here, you get, you know, miles and miles and miles of these blue bonnet fields. And even now, on a good year, you'll get them. They're even visible from airliners, so you can wow. see why we love it so much. They are lovely. You know, some of the other uh, perennial prairie plants that I've seen as we've been walking through the property um, are the, uh, the Soledegos. You've, you've got some, some goldenrod coming up. and. Also the, uh, the Gallardias, which is of course a very salt tolerant, extremely drought tolerant plant. Um, the, of course, typical Gallardias have the bright reds and oranges, yes. but even some of the native Texan Gallardias you'll find are white or even purple. So of course those are not as available in the trade, but beautiful nonetheless. And then also um, I've seen quite a bit of Coreopsis or tick seed, which is once again a super, super tough plant. And I'd imagine that works really, really well out here. Yes, I do. I mean, both those, a lot of the daisies, which flower a little bit later the, um, in the year, sort of getting into May, but they are, uh, they, as you said, they're very drought hardy and they're kind of really easy to grow. I mean, that's the sort of thing where you can almost just throw the seed down and, you, and, and you'll win through. Right. And I imagine in this part of the country, you've got uh, just a, a plethora of native salvias as well, don't you? Yeah, we have. And the interesting thing about the salvias, they are diverse, but there's a huge range of colors. Um, everything from, from blue, white, and even to some very scarlet colors as well. Yeah, what, another stark plant as far as the color goes that we see out here too is the primrose. You have these really soft pastel pinks that are blended in with some of these more, you know, assertive colors like the, the dark purples of the bluebells and, you know, the really, really deep, deep red salvias. So, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful planting that you have and, and, you know, almost every color we can imagine is represented here. Yes, I think, uh, and the, the primrose is a good example of something which grows and is synchronous with blue bonnets and the colors often help each other, very complementary, as we see in the Indian paintbrush as well, the castilleias. When you get a better blue bonnets like this with a few primroses and castilleias, it really shows it off to its best. Mark, there's clearly been a renaissance in the use of native plants in, in, the, in the last few decades, but perhaps the final frontier of all that is a native turf, which is quite new. In fact, the lion's share of the breeding work that's gone on in uh, turf grass um, are designed around recreational fields. It's a monoculture of centipede or Bermuda or St. Augustine. The turf you have here is very, very special. Um, what can you tell us about it? Well, we, one of the things we found out early on is that the uh, lawns were getting a bad reputation because of the water, the fertilizer, the pesticides. Um, and also just, you know, a lot of the lawns here in Texas we're finding weren't doing very well in the summer just because of water and, and right. water's getting expensive. 
So rather than um, trying to develop a new one, we want to look what native grasses we had, um, which would be suitable for turf, and we made a blend. And what we've got here is nine acres of this new blend, Haviturf, as we've trademarked it. And this grass is remarkable. It uh, grows slower, doesn't need as much mowing. You can go without watering it for months if you need to, or go dormant, but it won't die. Um, and one of the interesting uh, bits when we got, learned from the science was that it actually represses weeds as well. Wow. Um, and that's, so all these, these things together, I mean, we've got a very sustainable lawn here and we're trying to bring it back in the landscape rather than a, a, a landscape which is on life support like traditional lawns. Is there any special soil preparation requirements to use native grass? Yes, I think soil preparation, I mean, it's true for almost growing anything, but particularly turf grass. Um, for this one, we're recommending that you have a good four or six inches minimum mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, worked soil. Remember, these prairie species, if they've got the soil, they'll go down 10 feet, their roots, even these, these turf grasses. So soil preparation is essential for long-term good maintenance. Now let's talk about uh, let's talk about your just routine maintenance. This this looks like it's in it's an unmowed lawn and it's beautiful. I love the texture of it, the little dainty seed heads. But what what do you do as you're trying to establish well, a native lawn? You you've got a choice here with a, with a lawn like this. This this one here at the center is mowed to a height of about eight inches. Okay. You can go lower. You really don't want to go much below two inches though. That's what we're finding. So it can't be mowed as close as to many conventional turf grasses, but you get all these other additional advantages of sustainability. So how does it hold up to heavy traffic? Could it be used, say, on a soccer field and that kind of application? You know, the only thing we were so are saying is it doesn't stand up as well for athletic fields as, say, conventional horticultural varieties. But in all other respects, and it can handle moderate traffic, but in all other respects, it's a great grass for front yards. Is this going to be commercially available? Yes, it's already commercially available from seed suppliers here in Texas. Wonderful. It's great. One of the most unique features of the Presidential Center, I think, is this scale model of the Oval Office. And of course, the Oval Office in Washington looks out onto the Rose Garden. So, you know, clearly, you needed to design a garden here. Uh, of course, there, there aren't nearly as many roses here as there would be at the Oval Office in DC. Why is that? All right, well, as you said, and we want, wanted to use the same proportions and the scale of the Rose Garden, but when we came to do the plantings, we decided to go with the theme of being you know, almost entirely native. Now, there are roses here, but mm -hmm. if you look around, you can see there's a lot of the species we saw flowering out in the prairie in the wildflower meadows. So what, what is, what's the thinking behind the planting designer? You've got some annuals and some perennials. Um. Correct, right. So we've got some of the, the, the plants which, uh, which will stay, which will offer color through a lot of the season. But a lot of the, the plants, especially the annual, annuals, are going to switch out. So things like um, the Blue Bonnet, Texas Star, those can all be switched out as they come into bloom. So we're going to have color throughout the growing season. So also some great structural and, and, and vertical elements in the garden with the, the woodies. We've got the southern magnolia mm -hmm. and, of course, the Natchez crepe myrtle. So we've got two really strong white blooming plants. We're going to have fragrance with the magnolia. I noticed, you know, this is, of course, a very formal design. We've got a, you know, a zoysia lawn in front of us. And, uh, and all this is, is bordered by the, uh, the Yopon hollies, uh, which is, uh, I think, in many ways, a, a significantly more practical plant than boxwoods, which can be tough to grow. Yeah, this is well, a miniature Yopon holly, but, it, but it, you're right, it's hardier than um, box, and of course it's a local native. And we have this beautiful vista, you know, of course the Oval Office looks out on the Washington Monument. We're looking out now on uh, the, the skyline, um, and of course it overlooks this, this gorgeous prairie. Really, really well done. Mark, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed spending the day with you, and, and I think we've really seen the the, not only how beautiful, but how practical uh, native landscaping and design can be. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. Another show, another amazing garden. We hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as we've enjoyed producing it. If you watch the show, you know we travel the country visiting beautiful gardens. Well. We have a surprise in store for several in the audience. To learn more about the surprise, visit our website at gardensmart.com. 
The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program makes house calls. By ordering online, the lawn you want can be delivered right to your door. The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program is a proud sponsor of Public Television and Garden Smart. I should be arrested for crimes against potted plant kind. My house is where plants came to die. miracle Grow Potting Mix is designed to help grow big, beautiful plants. Everyone grows with miracle Grow. Today we visited a beautiful and expansive public garden that's used native plants to reflect the unique personality of its home state, as well as picking up some great information on how these gardens are built and maintained. If you have questions about anything you've seen today, visit us on the web at gardensmart.com. Remember, even if you're a master gardener, there's always more to learn. So join us next week for more great gardening tips and ideas as we garden smart.